Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SaaS Startups podcast. Today, I'm talking to Casper Wilstrup. Casper uh, is the, the CEO and co-founder of Abzu, and they're a, a seed-funded AI company seeking to build a, a new class of transparent and explainable AI models. Casper, welcome. Thank you, Ben. So I want to just kick things off by just asking you a few quick questions just to help the audience try and get to know you a little bit. So the first question, what fictional character would you most identify with? <laughs> that's easy. That's Doc Emmett Brown from, uh, from Back to the Future. <laughs> okay, that's the, the perfect kind of scientist, uh, entrepreneur, I guess. Yeah, I think I even look a little bit like him. At least I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, what would you say your spirit animal is? Wow, that would probably have to be a an ant. <laughs> an ant. Okay, is that because you like collaborating with uh, you know big groups well, of people? I've no. I just find it completely fascinating what uh, what social animals are able to do, even if they're insect uh, insects in to to self organize and to solve problems that you couldn't foresee that they'd be able to solve and uh, and ants is, the, uh, is 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 a pretty impressive example of that kind of self-organizing behavior in animals okay and i guess that kind of leads into like what what a lot of you got you're trying to do with absu as well yeah it, it certainly is i i think at, at absu we're certainly trying to do something that's very similar to what self-organizing systems in nature do whether those systems are ants nests or collaboration between humans or even something that happens on the atomic level. We're just trying to build something that emulates and, uh, and ex exploits some of the, the, the advantages that nature has also found in self-organizing systems. Um, and But we're doing it obviously in technology and using it to, to extract insight from, from data. Um, but I think that that's the overarching theme, self-organization and, uh, and, uh, and how you can apply that to uncover relationships Okay, so if you imagine that you are king for the day and you could make one change, big or small, to, to transform society for, for better or ill, what, what would you do? I think we have a, a, a feudal, actually maybe more an engineering era fixation with thinking about the way we collaborate as humans as if we were machines. So you think about companies as machines, about uh, organizations and about regulations, say in, 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 in um, societal reg regulations, as if you're designing a machine. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a nice metaphor. Uh, and in some situations, solving problems by turning them into a mechanistic machine-like solution is, is, is really efficient. But most of the time, uh, a more bottom-up kind of self-organizing approach is uh, is much more uh, beneficial to to society. So if I could do one thing, single thing, I would just erase our tendency to try to top-down manage everything, and uh, and replace that with a much more bottom-up idea about how to organize everything we do, from the way we make rules, from the way we enforce privacy laws, from the way we, but in my specific case, from the way we search for answers in data. Yeah, I mean, I guess we're still a society kind of born from the Industrial Revolution, essentially, aren't we? Which, um, you know, uh, you know, probably explains uh, a lot of what you thought there. I, so, I, I definitely say so, yeah. So the, the last one, just how, if you could change one trait in your personality, what would it be? Uh, whew, that uh, Impatience, I think. Um, I, I guess I, I don't mind being impatient. I am impatient. I really want to get on with things. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, that can also make me a little bit too pressing. And, uh, and uh, probably it, I could benefit from, from controlling my impatience better in many situations. Yeah. OK, perfect. So now um, if we jump into Abzu, <clears throat> so AI is obviously a huge focus for, for a a massive number of startup companies and investment for, for quite some time now. And I think obviously most com AI companies out there really fall into that, that black box trap of providing outputs without ever really telling us about how that result was achieved. 
And with Abzu, you, you're kind of fundamentally redesigning that approach. Do, do you want to give us an overview of the company and, and what you're trying to do? Yeah, but I think that's that's, that's spot on. I mean, most uh, AI solutions is trying to solve a problem of find, finding advanced relationships in data. Like so, so you have some kind of observational data, and you want to under, you want to be able to reason about that system that produced that data. And therefore you create a, a, an artificial intelligence model um, through various methods. And that model is able to somehow predict what the system is going to do in the future. But the model is a very complicated black boxy kind of thing that you as a human have no actual ability to, to get into or understand what is, what, what's doing. And in some circumstances that's fine, but in other circumstances that's not fine. And there can be a couple of reasons for that not being fine. One is that you, don't, you just need to be able to explain your reasoning. So an example is if you want to make a decision about who should get a certain cancer treatment and who should not, you can't really come with the answer, well, machine says so. Uh, you have, people will, will, will definitely ask, why can't, I, uh, why can't I get this cancer treatment? And then if you can't say, well, it's because, and then point to some kind of scientific model that has produced that decision, then you're actually... That, that would be ethical in my opinion. And, and it's, that's, that's one major problem with black box models. The other problem with black box models is that they are in a certain sense unscientific. Say that, uh, that you had been Johannes Kepler and you had been studying orbits of planets, that's what he did. Uh, and you were trying to build a model to predict the orbit of Mars, that's what he did. Uh, and if you had a machine learning method like of some, most of the AI tools used today uh, to do that with, you would have come up with a perfectly accurate black box model that could tell you where Mars would be at a point in the future. But Kepler did not want to have a black box model that could tell us where Mars would be. Kepler wanted to have an understanding of why Mars moved the way it does. So he instead found a simple set of rules. That's what we know as Kepler's laws that govern planetary motions. And those laws were then in turn used in other understanding about, about how the entire universe fits together and gravity and eventually moving on to even more modern physics. So that's science. And science stops if your theory becomes, well, computer says so. So theories need to be simple. Otherwise, they're actually not scientific at all. So those are the two typical settings. There are other settings where, where it's convenient to be able to understand not just what is going to happen, but why that is going to happen when you, when you reason about a certain system. And so what, what we're doing it in Absolute is to, we're actually applying, a, a, we're building a technology from scratch. So it's not neural networks. It's not in any of the, any of the methods that people are normally using in artificial intelligence. It is, it's completely from scratch. And what it's designed specifically to do is to look for the simplest possible answer under certain statistical constraints, obviously, uh, that can explain observational data. So in the Kepler example, if you do take the data that Kepler had, which was, by the way, collected by a, a Danish astronomer called Tycho Brahe, if you do take that data and run it through our system, you don't get a black box model out. You do actually get Kepler's laws of planetary motion out. Uh, and those are the kind of examples that, that, that shows what we want to do with our technology. It's, it's to use AI to uncover actual scientific or uh, causal relationships, even under some circumstances in data, and not just be able to, to fit that data so that you can make predictions. So just to, to kind of try and explain it super simple for the audience. So there's this kind of trade off between sort of how interpretable a model is and how kind of accurate the predictions are. So at the one end, you've got things like decision trees, which people can very easily follow and they're kind of very interpretable but might not give the most accurate outcomes. And then at the other end, we've got sort of deep learning black box, um, which are very accurate in terms of the outcomes that they produce, but are very difficult to interpret. And you're kind of bridging that gap by sort of offering like the best of both worlds. I mean, are you able to sort of explain in a, a kind of a simple way, you know, how you can do that? Um, well, I think the core, the gist of the problem is that if you, um, you're actually exactly right in, in putting those two things at, 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 at the different ends of the scale. You have simple models on the one end. I say an even simpler model that most people are, are quite used to is a linear model where your risk of developing cancer grows as you get older. That's a linear model or something like that. And at the other end of the scale, you have something that's completely opaque. You just have a bunch of input features and it, and it produces uh, some kind of prediction. But quite often, 
when you end up with a very complicated, when you end up applying a very complicated say deep learning model, there is actually a fairly simple explanation for the data you've observed. You just haven't found it because you only tried linear models or decision trees. But, but the actual model is a different one. Like Kepler's laws of planetary motion, you couldn't ever model that with a linear model or decision tree. It's, it's an ellipse and you have to model it as an ellipse around the, around the sun. So in uncovering this simple fact that it's just an ellipse, uh, that, that, that solves it. So if you didn't know that the way that planets move, you would believe, you could be led to think that you needed a neural network to predict orbit or uh, planetary orbits. Only once you see the clear, the simple model, do you know, oh, that's where, where that simple model is. Uh, that's, that's how it actually is, how that system actually behaves. The problem with finding the simple model is that you're searching through an infinite space. <laughs> there is, the moment I tell you it's not a linear model, then there's essentially an infinite list of possible models you could apply. Uh, and how do you then find that model? It's like searching for a needle in, a, in an infinite haystack. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and that's why in, in data where the, where, the situation, where the solution isn't obvious, people fall back to, to the, or oh, apply this of very powerful uh, machine learning techniques like neural networks and, 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 and a whole bunch of other uh, techniques. But what we, have, what we have proven is by searching through this infinite space for that needle, you quite often do find a needle in the haystack that is a simple explanation that is just as powerful, actually typically even stronger than the neural network models because it uncovers the actual underlying process that isn't linear. So I think the, 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 the core problem that we have tackled is searching through an infinite set a uh, space of possible mathematical relationships. And that's where the entire quantum story comes into play because we're in a way we're, we're, we're utilizing the fact that in quantum physics, you can actually model infinite spaces or infinite paths, uh, technically speaking. So we're, that's, it's, and uh, without having to go into the, the finer details of how that works, we're essentially using a quantum, superpos quantum superposition to explore an infinite set of possible explanations for observed data. Okay, yeah, I mean, absolutely fascinating. Um, so I had a call from our lawyers and they said that it's actually illegal to do a podcast about AI without mentioning Terminator and, and all those other scare stories. Now, and even though they're, they're all obviously, you know, outlandish stories and, and designed to kind of play on our, on our emotions, the, the topic of, of AI safety is an important one. And especially as AI models become more and more powerful, safety is something which commands a huge amount of investment now and, and the attention of some of the, the best and brightest in the industry. Do you see what you're doing with Abzu as uh, playing an important role in that? And how do you see the, the kind of industry of, of AI safety in, in general at the moment? Yes. So I think in terms of, um, of artificial intelligence and, and ethics, you could say, there are really two problems. And one is probably a pseudo problem, at least for the time being. And the other is more, is more pressing. So to start with the first, it's the Terminator style problem. It's, it's the idea that we're building an AI that's smarter than us and then it's going to outsmart us and do bad things to us. That I think is being promoted by futurists who, who, who want to, to, to say interesting things because actually we are very, very far from that future. There, is, there, is, there are no such technologies that can think in any meaningful sense. So if I say to you, how many red cars are there in Spain? you start a cognitive process that can lead to an answer where you think of how many people do they live and how many do they have, they have red cars. There's also companies, you have a cognitive process. That process has not been recreated in computers. Um, so computers can learn to fit a similar data set to make predictions that are equivalent to number of cars per country per, per, with various input features, but you can do something else. You can reason in a cognitive way. Uh, the moment we start building computers that are cognizant in that sense, um, you will, will also know because it'll start scoring more than 10 in IQ tests. Um, and uh, the moment we do that, we are actually zooming in on building com com artificial brains that can compete with us. And then we should probably think, I wouldn't say we should do it, but we should definitely think about what we're doing and why and, and the risks involved. But that story aside, because that's not the actual problem in this day and age. The actual problem with artificial uh, intelligence in this day and age is that we are making decisions that we don't understand because the artificial intelligence models we build today are not intelligent. They're just fitting data. So if you see a pattern in data, whether that pattern has uh, to do with, uh, with um, 
with making decisions about who should get certain kind of treatments, like in my example before, or some of the more notorious examples from recently where it's been credit scoring uh, people where you, it turned out to be gender biased, the, 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 the models that were made. The problem was not per se that, the, that, we, that we weren't ethical. The problem were that, or that these machines were thinking in any way that we couldn't. The problem was that we didn't know what the models did. We used a model that did something that we did not understand because it was too complex for us to understand. So that's the black box part. So I think, in my opinion, it should actually not, you should not apply black box models in, this, in, in settings where ethical things plays a role. So it's fine to do it if you want to, I don't know, let's have other people come up with the examples. I care about, uh, about white box models. So in, in kinds of situations where you really do want to know what happens if people have a different gender, then you can't use a black box model because you can't test it. That's just, it's, I think another a way to phrase that is, if you have a model that takes gender and a hundred other parameters as input and then makes a decision about whether you should have a credit scoring or not, then if you change the gender, you have to test how the model behaves under all other configurations of those other hundred parameters, which is an infinite problem in its own right. So you cannot ever know how that model behaves for men versus women. You can only know how it behaves for men versus women in a very, very small subset of the tests of the cases that it will run into in real life. So you wouldn't be able to say that. So if you have that kind of constraint, then you just can't use a black box model, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting answer. And I think you might have answered the, the next question that I've got. Because um, at the moment, you really focus on the, the, the life sciences industry with, with Absu. Um, but do you see that this solution kind of generalizing to, to lots of other industries as well? I mean, from what you were just saying, it sounds like it's really widely applicable. Yeah, I, I'd say so. I mean, we are an absolute, uh, we can't uh, conquer the entire world in one day. So, so we've zoomed in on one of the two uh, areas where white box models are extremely important, and that is in science. Um, so most of the work we do in Absu is actually in the, in the earlier stages of drug development, where, you, where you're trying to understand why certain, say, molecules are toxic to the liver, uh, or why certain molecules are better at binding to certain say um, spike proteins and virus or something like that. And where a black box model can, can, can perhaps predict whether a certain molecule is going to bind or be toxic, we can explain why it binds or is toxic, which means that, uh, that the scientists working with our technology can actually get insight into the process and thereby design around, uh, around it all together. So, there's like a lot of ways that drugs can become liver toxic, but uh, but if you understand them, then you can design drugs that don't have those properties. So a white box model will allow you to know what you're doing. A black box model will allow you to make predictions about whether certain random choices are going to work or not. So that's that's a core difference. So scientists ref re reflect well with our technology, but there's nothing specific about life science, particularly not this early drug discovery part of, of the work where, where we have a lot of experience right now, uh, that is specific to, to, to our technology. Our technology could be applied in any situation where you want to understand something. So I gave you the example from Kepler's, Kepler's laws, and that's, that's, that's clearly not life science, right? But it, it definitely is the case that if you're a physicist and you want to analyze data that you collected, you can uncover interesting mathematical relationships that you didn't know about by applying our technology. The same in marketing. If you have marketing data about why people buy or not buy certain things, with our technology, you can uncover simple mathematical explanations of how this behavior comes about uh, and not just be able to predict who will buy what. And again, maybe you're, maybe you're happy with predicting who will buy what, but if you understand what makes people buy certain things, then you have an opportunity to change. You have an opportunity to do things differently because you understand the process that leads to these purchases. So yes, Absus vision, is to be a horizontal technology that is applicable across everywhere where people care about white box models um, and uh, for whatever reason. Um, but at this time, uh, most of our actual work with customers is, is in the life science, specifically big pharma field. Yeah, okay. So just to, to kind of pivot a little bit and just talk about the, the kind of startup life. So with Abzu, You've had around nine, just over $9 million investment so far. And I'm interested when you kind of developed this company, did you develop it because you saw a market opportunity 
or was it an important area of research that you didn't see anybody else doing and, and you, you know you wanted to do it for that reason yeah so the answer is the latter uh, just a disclaimer i've been i've also been working uh, on the vc side for many years um and uh, and in general, I think that companies that set out to solve a business problem uh, are fair better, and their and their and their, their trajectory to, to success is easier to understand, and and uh, and success is actually more likely in a certain sense. But uh, but the companies that really change the world are the companies that do something else. They they set out to radically rethink how something is done on a deep technological level, and in in VC circles, you call that deep tech. Um, so essentially, when you build a technology, you could be mean and say a technology looking for a problem, then you're in, in, in the deep tech space. So for my, for my case, actually, this idea for what we're building in Absolute has been an idea that I've had for uh, a long time ago. That was, that was going to solve the problem at that time. Uh, due to uh, due to uh, computational resource limits, obviously, so it's just been bubbling there. But it doesn't mean that it hasn't been that it was a technology looking for a problem. I've always known that if we were able to build technology like technology like the one we have currently built, we would be able to solve a class of problems that was that has so far been more or less unsolvable. Uh, and specifically in life science or, or research. So it's a combination. But I would definitely say that when I found the company. So actually, what I did was I, I was um, I, I had just finished my my last uh, job at a at another startup company. Where it was time for me to move on, and then I went I I went around and 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 I thought about how to do this in reality, and I set up the ideal team that I could come up with. So I essentially found the best people that I've gotten to know with over the last that I've gotten to know over the last twenty five years in startup life, and asked them. Do you want to be part of this crazy journey? And uh, some of them said yes, and some of them said no. Uh, so we ended up with a with a with a pretty awesome founding team in Absolute. Actually, actually, seven people all in all founded the company from uh, from across Europe. Um, and that is definitely not the typical setting for a startup company. Definitely not. But it was 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 required for this specific crazy moonshot idea about building a quantum simulator to uncover mathematical relationships uh, from an infinite search list. And like within the company, like you, you've got to marry together a really diverse set of backgrounds. So you've got, you know, people in deep learning and neuroscience and mathematics and bioinformatics. Does that give you any challenges, like keep, keeping everybody on the same page? Yeah, uh, certainly. I mean, there's, there, there, we have a common language, which is you know, scientific scientific arguments, rational debate is 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 easy to establish now. So, but also, uh, it's 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 a it's a very big strength that we that we that we have experts in so many different things. But it also means that there is not a there's not a certain specific thing that we're all experts on. So, for instance, me, I'm not an expert on life science. Uh, everything I know today about how organisms work and how compounds interact with with, uh, with, with say proteins or other things, uh, structures in our cells and our body. I've learned that within the last year. So that has been a steep learning curve, uh, but it's also very fruitful. And I think the other people here are, I'd say most of our bioinformaticians or biophysicists will say, I did not know that much about quantum. I didn't know anything about quantum physics before I started in Absolute. And we have a bunch of, uh, of say data scientists who now are us, us very good engineers, software engineers, which is, um, which is another kind of two worlds meet. So, so we have that kind of fertile cross, uh, cross pollination happening in, 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 in Absolute because we all, we all share a deep scientific curiosity, I think. So that's what, that's what unites us, but it's definitely, it's, it's definitely a different, it, it is not as easy as if we had been more, more, uh, more of the same kind of, of people, all of us with the same kind of understanding and, 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 and professional backgrounds. So, but I, I wouldn't prefer, I wouldn't like it any other way. I love to come here every day and be challenged by people who know things that I just have no clue about. Yeah, no, fantastic. And you describe yourself as a, an applied research startup. So as this evolves from uh, kind of academia to, to more of a commercial endeavor, does that, you know, do you see any conflicts there in, in terms of the, the kind of direction of the company? 
Yeah, I think we have a we have a a, a, a hyper inflated version of a problem that I've seen many startup companies again. I'm not lying if I say I've done due diligence on more than 80 different companies over the years. So I've seen a lot of startup companies. And I think there's a commonality, which is, um, which is uh, switching from, I call it switching from project mode to product mode with your, with your business idea. So if, if your business idea is using a known technology um, to solve an, a, new, uh, a new business problem, then quite often you'll have some early pilot pro uh, customers who will kind of guide you and who are, have uh, wield a lot of power over you and you should let them wield that power. You should let them guide you to build something that's actually useful for those people. But you also need to make the path from being their project people to figuring out what is the common denominator between these, these early customers and an entire market segment. So you need to make that transition where the decisions are hard because sometimes you have to say no to features for your most trusted, most important customers because you're in the face of moving towards more scalable software as a service product, for instance. Um, and that is that some people do make do that change uh, effortlessly and intuitively, whereas a lot of companies struggle in that phase and, and keep getting stuck in building features that are just very tailored to a specific customer, essentially building a Frankenstein of a product. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, that's pretty much a make or break path. I, I think that's a make or break period for many companies. If, if you don't make that transition, you don't necessarily break, but you'll definitely not become this hockey stick startup success that you, that you perhaps hope to be, or at least most startups investors hope that they will be. Um, because that's just, that's just the nature of the game. You have to generalize, you have to find the common, common denominator uh, in, in, in a large market uh, and then go after that. And uh, we have the same problem, obviously. We build a technology that is extremely suitable for, for, for scientists and some of the world's biggest pharma companies. And, and they, they'll happily pay us, pay us to sit there with our awesome technology and solve their problems, whatever they may be in siRNAs or mRNA vaccines or whatever that may be. But we as a company need to remember that we're building a technology that, that is more general than that. So, so, so make sure that we don't lose track of that and don't forget to build that, that eventually hockey stickable product that will allow us to, to scale our business commercially. That is definitely also a, an important challenge for us. We won't fumble it though, because one thing that I have learned uh, over many years is, is this. So I, I'm probably more mindful of that than, than many startup companies, but it would definitely, it's, it's an advice that I always try to pass on when I meet, meet, meet startup companies. Do the project work, do whatever it takes to make your early customers happy, but know when to stop, know when to say, now we're going to, now we're going to synthesize, now we're going to build the product that is scalable and say no to all those features that doesn't match. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've just got one one last question because I know we're, we're going slightly over, and I, I'm very aware of your time. Um, so just when, when you're uh, looking at hiring decisions um, in in kind of the early stages of building a company, especially with this kind of like moonshot type solution that that you described there. Are you just looking for like the smartest individuals that you can find? Or are you also looking for candidates who've got that kind of adaptability to, to thrive in a startup environment? Because I'm kind of thinking that, that not every academic is, is going to be cut out for this type of company. Would that be right? Well, I think thriving in a startup environment is, is if you're an academic, then typically that is not the problem because you, you already are used to very, say, chaotic and actually self-managed day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, one thing that some academics need to learn and maybe don't want, don't want to learn is the collaborative aspect, uh, because yeah. I, I think it's hard for me to rank these two features, because in order to succeed in Absa, you have to be both good with the science, whatever that's, whatever specific domain it is that you're at, but you probably have to be as good with the, with what people, I guess, would term emotional intelligence EQ. Um, because this this is crucial. This differs absolutely differs from the, we are across this team, but we are doing a single thing together, 
and uh, you can't go on on a tangent with some bioinformatics research project or some quantum theoretical physical speculations or some mathematical um, thesis of your, of your, you just can't you have to you have to continuously go back towards our shared objectives which we are really good at defining together but you have to play by that but by, by, by those otherwise we would be like a jellyfish trying to swim in all different directions which i think a lot of uh, of, uh, of uh, university departments actually kind of reminds me of. Um, so I think when I do recruiting, this is one of the highest uh, highest uh, priorities. On the, it's a must have, you have to have that team spirit. I don't know, it's such it's an overused spot, but the emotional intelligence to actually see what's happening around you, see what what, are, what, what we're trying to do as a team. So maybe a ball player, if, if you're good at, at team sports, I think you're also, um, yeah. I've also seen team sports players who wanted to be captain instead of the captain, and that was all that mattered. But uh, <laughs> but I guess I, I guess you get my drift. Um, yeah, yeah. Team play is 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 crucial. But then of course, being so scientific heavy, you also have to have this this at least understanding. Even the people we have for commercial are well fed in 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 science in one sense or another, uh, which fortunately. A lot of commercial people are. Economics is also science, so that's that's a good source of commercial people who who fit in well in our culture. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, it's been really great having you on, Casper, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so, if people want to get in touch with Absu, um, what what's the best way? Should they reach out on LinkedIn or, or through the website? Yeah, reach out to me or whoever you you think is relevant on and you can, on LinkedIn. But I think if you go uh, if you want to talk about something specific on our website on the Teams page, we have actually far, fairly detailed descriptions of what what people do in Upsu. So find find your upside of choice, but that may be me, and uh, then reach out. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, um, you know, we covered a lot of ground, and you know, I'm really interested to kind of see where this company goes over the coming years. So um, you know, it'd be great to get you on in a couple of years, and we can sort of catch up on what you've done since then. Yes, I'd love that. Okay, appreciate your time. Thank you, Casper. Thank you very much, Ben. Bye.